deviations in the orbits of Uranus and Neptune point to a large outer solar system body of four to eight Earth masses on a highly tilted orbit beyond seven billion miles from the Sun. In the past two decades, astronomers have joined the search to look for one more planet in our own solar system. They designate such a planet, Planet X, meaning both unknown and tenth. August 1978, which was just about six weeks after we discovered the fact that Pluto has a satellite. Once you have a satellite for a planet, you can determine how heavy it is. It turns out Pluto is very much smaller and lighter weight than we had thought, which meant that Pluto has no influence, no appreciable influence on the motions of the planets Uranus and Neptune. At that point, we voiced a hypothesis that this means that there is at least one yet to be discovered planet in the outer reaches of the solar system. Over the past two decades, physicists have joined astronomers in the search for the mysterious Planet X. Now, one of the things we, we did in 1978, having made this prediction that there was a, an additional planet, 10th or 12th, depending on your point of view, we sort of put our money where our mouth was, as it were, we went out and we started looking for this thing. We've been able to refine the search area somewhat, and get it rather narrowed down. We, we do our predictions based on the observed anomalies in Uranus and Neptune. We actually are currently looking down in the region of Centaurus which is just south of the, of the constellation Libra. Now, if, if it is in the kind of orbit that we describe here, it would have to be a planet that would have a mass something like three to five times the mass of the Earth. This would put it uh, intermediate between the gaseous planets like Uranus and Neptune and the terrestrial planets that we, we have in the inner part of the solar system. So if, if this planet turns out to be in a 3,600-year orbit, then its, its mass will be correspondingly larger. This one here is a map of the solar system as we know it. Uh, the inner planets, this is the orbit of planet Pluto. And this here is the orbit that I have proposed for uh, the tenth planet. And here's where we think it is right about now in its orbit. If planet X exists, we are not alone. However, today on this video is that just recently news reports have come out that there may be a massive super earth type planet orbiting outside our solar system that we don't know about and this is confirmed and I'll put the links in the video description so you guys can check it out so here's what we found dwarf planet discovery hints at a super earth in our solar system astronomers have increased the size of the observable solar system after spotting a 450 kilometer wide object orbiting the Sun the lump of ice and rock circles the sun at a greater distance than any known object. If its size is confirmed, it could qualify as a dwarf planet in the same category as Pluto. Researchers said that the discovery proves the existence of the inner Oort cloud, a region of icy bodies that lies far beyond the orbit of Neptune. And let's remember that Neptune is the most remote planet in our solar system. Until a proper name is decided upon, the body is known only as 2012 VP113. According to the science journal Nature, the team that discovered it called it VP for short, or Biden after U.S. Vice President Joe Biden. Its pink tinge comes from the radiation damage that alters the makeup of frozen water, methane, and carbon dioxide on the surface. Though exciting in its own right, the discovery raises more tantalizing prospect for many astronomers that a super-Earth, up to 10 times the mass of our planet, orbits the Sun at such a great distance that it has never been seen. Astronomers found 2012 VP113 by taking snapshots of the night sky an hour or so apart with an instrument called the Dark Energy Camera on the U.S. National Optical Astronomy Observation Telescope in Chile. When they turn the images into a time-lapse movie of the sky, they could see the new body moving against the background of stationary stars. This object has the most distant orbit known, Scott Shepard at the Carnegie Institution of Washington told The Guardian. It extends the known boundary of the observable solar system. The object's orbit brings it as close as 12 billion kilometers from the sun and swings out as far as 67 billion kilometers. There are comets that come from even farther out, but they pass much closer to our home planet. The solar system has three distinct regions. Closest to the sun are the rocky planets, such as Venus, Earth, and Mars. Farther out are the gas giants, such as Saturn and Jupiter. More distant still, beyond the orbit of Neptune, is a band of icy objects called the Kuiper Belt. In 2003, astronomers found an object beyond the Kuiper Belt, which they called Sedna. For more than a decade, the object was a loner, an anomaly in the solar system, but the new body, 2012 VP113, lurks in the same no man's land of space, leading astronomers to believe that there could be thousands of similar bodies waiting to be discovered there. People wondered if Sedna was unique, and 10 years on, we have at last found another object that shows it is not. There is probably a large population of objects out there. 
The latest work has already thrown up an intriguing possibility. The angle of the body's orbit and that of Sedna's are strikingly similar, an effect most likely caused by a gravitational tug of another unseen body. One possibility is a super-Earth that traces so large an orbit around the Sun that it has never been seen. If you took a super-Earth and put it a few hundred astronomical units out, the gravity could shepherd Sedna and this new object into the orbits they have. An astronomical unit is around 150 million kilometers, or the mean distance from the Earth to the Sun. Earlier this month, NASA's Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer, or WISE, reported the results from its search. Okay guys, this is uh, Frank, and I'm doing an update on uh, the Black Star uh, object, Fiery Messenger, or um, Second Sun, whatever you want to call it. Uh, today is June 22nd, uh, 2014. And the reason why I'm doing this update is because there is quite some confusion about uh, the current low period on the planet. There's not so much seismic activity as we had in April or May and March. Um, and I wanted to get the picture clear myself, so this is why I'm doing the update. And I think I know the reason why this is happening, um, and I'll show that to you. This is an article that I wrote in uh, January this year. It's about fire messenger, that's what I prefer to call it. And if I go down... You can see how I started the investigation. Um, it, I, it, it started when I did some research on earthquakes, and I noticed that between 1700 and 1952, um, there were only three magnitude, two, magnitude 9 earthquakes, and they all occurred with Uranus in approximately the same area in the sky. This, uh, and I thought this is not a coincidence. And so I, I, I dug into that a little, and then I uh, went into the history of Planet X, which goes back all the way to the um, 19th century, um, you can read this all here, this is the entire history. The interesting thing here is that astronomers in the early 80s actually confirmed um, what Uranus already indicated, which is an object uh, on the western part of the constellation Orion, which is here. You can see this on the picture. This is the western part of Orion, and here's Uranus during those um, large earthquakes between 1700 and 1868, uh, 1952. Uh, so this was actually the first confirmation for me. And then I found, uh, here's the planet's ecliptic, which means that the object is coming from the south uh, and then slowly going upwards in, into the inner solar system. Um, there's actually a picture of this object, and here it is. Uh, you, can you may wonder if this is the real object. I think it is. It was uh, found by some guy on YouTube. Uh, he has the coordinates on the western part of Orion. And Google Sky, this picture was taken between 2000 and 2005. And Google Sky at the same coordinates is showing something completely different. It, it has masked the object completely. And I zoomed in and I had some difficulty doing that. But um, if you don't zoom in and you just get your coordinates, you just see this as background uh, stars or whatever. So it, it does, you, don't, you don't see it. It, do, it goes unnoticed. But if you zoom in and you know what to, what to look for, namely this object, I mean, if you look at the stars here, uh, around it, they are at exactly the same position. So this has brightened up a little bit. The stars look brighter, but they certainly uh, completely mask the object here. And they did that for a reason. And the uh, blacked out box in Google Sky, uh, somewhere else near the western part of Orion, is just a decoy. That's not at all interesting. This is what it's really about. And uh, well, you can read this article for yourself the Trail of Earthquakes with all the constellations. Um, that's not what I'm want to do now. Uh, it's about the western part of Orion. It's about this object coming from the south. Um, why am I showing this to you? Well, what I noticed, if I go to uh, EMSC here, and I wanted to know when exactly magnitude 8 earthquakes occurred during the last 10 years. Well, between uh, October 4, I think in October, it's where the database from EMSC started. Uh, to today, um, this time period, magnitude earthquakes, I entered it here, and the events, there are only 13 of them. Uh, what's interesting about these earthquakes is that they all occurred somewhere between September and May. You don't see any of these earthquakes in during the months June, July, and August. And there's a, there must be a reason for it. There has to be. So I wanted to find out if that also fits the, um, you know, the theory or well, the pieces of the puzzle that I had so far that you can read here in this article. And in order to find that out, we have to go to Solar System Scope. And um, there it is. This is today. And 
let's see. What I want to do here is I want to line up the sun with um, Orion. Orion, that's here. This is Orion. Here you can see it. This is the constellation Orion, and I want to line that up here. So like this. So the sun is actually in the middle of Orion, like that. This here is the western part of Orion. Now, why is that interesting? Like I said, what you see here, especially during the last four years, magnitude 8 plus earthquakes occurred February, March, April, May, April. So between, Mar uh, between February and May. This is the, the area uh, of Earth's orbit that we should take a look at. Now let's do that here. Here's the Earth, and I draw it back to February. Here, this is the beginning of February. Um, maybe January as well. But here's February, early February, and then all the way up to May. You see what's happening? You see what's going on here? You see that? This is exactly the area where the Earth, its orbit around the Sun, goes through the imaginary line um, drawn through the object coming from the south, from the western part of Orion. This is the western part of Orion area where the Earth goes through during this time period. So during February, you see that? This is February uh, here, around here it starts, here's where it starts. And th these were the coordinates where also where Uranus was during those large earthquakes in the in 250 years time. It was in this area. It's also in the western part of Orion. Can I get Earth? Yes, here it is. So, and this year in April, that's where it started. This was the highlight of activity around this area here. And if we look at we look at this here from this side. You see that this is um, seen from the opposite side with the Earth in the Virgo constellation, the Saturn there in Libra constellation. I don't think um, uh, Saturn deserves to be followed any longer because uh, I don't think that Saturn is a catalyst anymore. I believe this is the case um, because I can't find any pattern anymore, any pattern that that we can recognize and that we can follow. There's confusion because I expected uh, large earthquakes in the month of May. Instead, they occurred in April. And I believe the only explanation, I mean, we had eight magnitude seven plus earthquakes, eight of them in 19 days, in the first 19 days of April. Um, in under normal circumstances, that's a, year, a yearly average. You know what I mean? <laughs> this is, I mean, this is insane. Seven, um, eight magnitude seven plus earthquakes. We had April one. We had the magnitude eight earthquake in Chile, and then followed by uh, seven magnitude seven plus earthquakes until April nineteen. And then throughout the month of May, we also had quite some magnitude six earthquakes. And then also that went down uh, after May the twenty or so, which is here. And here you can see it's the Earth is really going outside the area of influence on the western part of Orion. You see what I mean? So if I put the sun back. I line it up again with Orion here, um, and we draw the Earth further in its orbit. The question is, when will things um, become interesting again? Well, that depends a little. We don't know exactly where the object is. Uh, this area, this is very important to understand, this area here is a low period area. And this is because the Sun is actually shielding the Earth from the black star influence. This is what's happening here. You see? There are in this area, in June, this is early June, July, and August, we haven't had any large earthquakes, magnitude April's earthquakes, during the last uh, 10 years, at least. And if you um, go further back in time, the largest earthquakes, in, uh, uh, starting in 1900 anyway, also did not occur during this time period here, in June, July, August. They, they never did. It was January, or it was May, or it was March. Uh, or it was December, but never in this area. This is because the sun is shielding the Earth, in my opinion, anyway. So uh, then when the Earth comes around, and then things become interesting again. So here it starts again. So early September, uh, half September, in that area, somewhere there. Things, because the sun is no longer shielding the Earth. From um, guiding star. What's interesting about it is that it seems to be speak. At first, you might think it's talking about the sun, right? You know, God, Jah, Rastafari as the sun. But then there's 
the immediate connection when you understand the whole Nibiru connection with, um, and now that we're speaking on the connection with Moses and what the ancient Egyptians knew, who knew what when. You know, it's obvious that the ancient Egyptians preserved a more ancient record that came out of Ethiopia. You understand? Now, this record also was communicated to the Medeanites. We have that Hebrews in ancient Egypt, which were a particular um, religious denomination. Now, in ancient Egypt, like in this society, we all communicate out of certain similar symbols. You know, how, how symbols are used. Now, how they interpret it in different religious orders, it differs. Now, what we have right here in ancient Egypt, we can see this whole idea, like even right here, this, this idea of a birth within this orb right here. You understand? This new birth, right? Um, remember, Israel was, was Jah's son that he called out of Egypt. Now, when we look at it celestially, if we look at it from the heavens and we put up the um, thing on, um, on Orion or Orion, and it's said to come from and emanate, in a sense, or, or its trajectory is coming from the Orion. Now, this is the Egyptian um, perspective of Nibiru and the Orion constellation. We know from the Western European and Greeks, they picture Orion differently. The, the Egyptians seem to picture it more in the Hebraic sense of the Soa, because if you see his hand, it fades off here, and you can see the stars. He's um, sowing the stars right here, and he's carrying a staff, in that sense, like a shepherd, right? So he's, he's sowing these stars, and there's a seven stars connection, and we touched on um, Amos, Amos, um, I think Amos 5, where it's saying, look to the one who, 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 um, who makes the seven stars and, and Orion. Now, there's one particular planet that's of particular interest, and that is called, uh, some say, the tenth planet. You understand? The tenth planet, or Nibiru, right? you to vote on the news and here's the winner there's a huge hidden heavenly body right here in our solar system evidence is mounting that either a brown dwarf star or a gas giant planet is lurking at the outermost reaches of our solar system far beyond the planet pluto according to the british newspaper the independent the object is four times the size of jupiter experts say the presence of such a massive object could explain why a barrage of comets has been coming from that direction you to vote on the news and here's the winner there's a huge hidden heavenly body right here in our solar system evidence is mounting that either a brown dwarf star or a gas giant planet is lurking at the outermost reaches of our solar system far beyond the planet pluto according to the british newspaper the independent the object is four times the size of jupiter experts say the presence of such a massive object could explain why a barrage of comets has been coming from that direction Whether this, that orbits the, the sun, whether it's an asteroid or a comet or Earth or Jupiter, they have a aphelion position on the far end where the object is moving its minimum velocity and a perihelion position where the object is nearest the sun and moving at maximum velocity. Okay, so if this object truly did reach perihelion and is now on the outbound, you see it's moving now back to the location, moving through Leo and Virgo, Libra. You see now it's getting ready to go into the quadrant of space that includes Scorpio and Sagittarius. It's possible, since we're dealing with an anomalous object, is the reason that I'm considering this. It makes not, no sense to me how the object could be increasing in velocity. In other words, instead of 188 days, now we're beyond, 100, uh, beyond 204 days. This object should be slowing down if I'm on the back side of the orbit, if you will. If the near side is the uh, reaching perihelion and the, and the far side is, is slowing down, going towards aphelion position, if you guys are following me then I'm going to have to make room for that possibility even though the data doesn't appear to point that way it it's possible a researcher sometimes gathers enough evidence and then draws a conclusion too early and then shapes everything to fit that you know that duck that walks like a duck and sounds like a duck and sounds more and more like a duck if you slant the data that way and am I guilty of that I'm not sure yet but I want to keep an open mind and uh, I think you guys will find the questions that get you will get into scripture some, 
and he's uh, he's asking about survival group sizes and things like that. And I'm uh, he asked me about Gil Broussard, and his work mirrors that of of the uh, Harrington model, and uh, he's the seven the planet seven X guy. So it's possible. I'm going to have to give their work. A, I, I've been looking at it disinformation, like I said, and so I'm going to leave. I'm going to leave that door open. I'm going to leave, leave that folder open and and see if the data doesn't point that way. Th that would explain that would explain some things that are inconsistent in my current modeling, actually. So the uh, the Black Star and the Sandbox type program models. See, when you look at this video right here, then there, a question question came in from Kale. And he's going to be looking at the sandbox model. That's where you look at a picture of the, of the, of the inner solar system, and then using that model, it's going to predict how the the objects inside the inner solar system are going to react to a heavy mass object that comes in. The problem is that the uh, the gravity well shape of the Sun, the Earth, Jupiter, they're all the same. They're just larger and smaller. But the Earth, Jupiter, and Saturn, the Sun are made up of regular. Um, molecules that are filled with air, like balsa wood, in comparison to the black star that all the subatomic particles are compressed together. So you're going to get a, uh, I use the example of a, a putting a bowling ball in the middle of your king size bed. That gives you the shape of the gravity wells. And that's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's one way to look at gravity well. It's actually three dimensions. Okay, but with a black star type object where all the objects are compressed together, then, um, you're going to take a pool stick and put it in the center of your bed and then put your car on top of it. It's going to push the well way, 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 way down. And microlensing is going to be perfected, and that's the re one of the reasons that you can't see it. Along with the perspiration release of subatomic particles, like every star does, releases its outer skin, then uh, it causes it to perspire and then become cold. Remember that the visible spectrum is the visible, the electromagnetic spectrum. I mean, light and radio waves and x-rays, all of these are electromagnetic waves. The electromagnetic spectrum is represented by taking your arms and put, putting them out as far as you can. And then the visible spectrum is about three inches in front of your nose. So there's plenty of, of space there. There's plenty of room for objects that we just can't see. And this object that I'm tracking is one of those objects. It's definitely not a planet. It is definitely a star-like object. And uh, but whenever you bring in experts, pardon me, when you bring in experts, they always have a model to explain what's going on. Uh, so for example, the magnetic pull migration that's going on right now, then there's a model. The, the, this happens three to seven times every million years. Well, if I'm talking to one of these geologists, then he's going to have the explanation. But if we're being influenced by a black star, another magnet is in the inner solar system, then we're going to get say, very much the same thing, but for a different reason. That's, uh, that question came up on the recent radio show, why I'm not using more lettered people, and it's because they are all inside-the-box thinkers. And to run this investigation, you have to, you have to think, be able to think outside the box and stand there deliberately and, um, well, reject the, the common interpretations. You know, what turned the magnetosphere around March 12th and 13th, 2012, one year and one day after Fukushima? See, that's a part of the research that traditional modeling is not going to even begin to explain because that kind of thing is impossible. There's a story here on the list of train wrecks and derailments since April of 2013. Now this is a, this is a little bit stunning that there's been this many train wrecks around the world and trains colliding, being derailed. There's a lot of information there and there seems to be a pattern with the earth changes uh, that are going on. So uh, whenever I Looked at over, looked over all the data for this week. Then, the Earth is still responding to our backside alignment, a shortening of the magnetic portal connection, heating up, but it is cooling off now. The these stories of the um, magma chambers um, outgassing. These stories, pardon me, I'm not, I'm having difficulty. The uh, these stories are diminishing now, although they are still happening. Just because we're in an Earth change low period does not mean the Earth changes go away. That means that they decrease in frequency and intensity. Right. Well, look at this value. This is a very important number right here. All this is the 2.5 to 4 magnitude quakes. These numbers represent. This is the highest number, right? That has the the uh, caldera bulging and con and contracting values inside. We went from 225 to 312. That's the second highest number of the year just recently. Now we're down to 178. Uh, what's going on? You see, you have a lot of movement here. 
related to this the volcanism that's still going on but now as things subside this value is going to get down to about 140 but it's going to bounce up and down up and down up and down and uh, but wind up see next week I would expect to see maybe 240 250 um, bouncing back up but not as high as this number then this number then these guys are going to bounce and go down 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 until we get about to 140 150 on February the 1st that's what I'm expecting so the uh, the indicators are pointing to the fact that we are definitely in the earth change low period you notice there's no reports of solar flares and things like that we get that at the alignments so I'm expecting to see the solar flare activity to heighten in May of 2014 that was March and that was September in 2011 and that's all moving around to the left with my object that's moving around left in the orbit diagram so yes we're seeing evidence of uh, of shakers in diverse places you know in Connecticut they're getting small tremors and things like that earth is finding equilibrium that's what's happening that for every action there's a there's an equal and opposite reaction the earth is reacting to what just happened with the uptick but now I would like to offer people the uh, information that was uh, passed to me by the extraterrestrials that are willing to, to help. If you get the latest uh, uh, update from the Fermi uh, Gamma Ray uh, Space Telescope, uh, a cosmic jet was actually uh, recorded in the Milky Way galaxy, which is 25,000 light years uh, in every direction from the, from the galactic plane. So in uh, crop circles like this, you see a source of energy that is spreading towards the edges, and this energy is extremely fast, is massive, and it's, and it's coming and it's almost at uh, near us this is the picture of the Milky Way galaxy and uh, when it comes it's going to hit the Sun and produce uh, something that is called uh, a red giant face
This wave of energy is a few million degrees Celsius and is highly magnetic. And the surface of the sun is only 6,000 degrees Celsius. If something that is millions of degrees Celsius touches a surface of a plasma that is only 6,000 degrees Celsius, it would be enough for the star to spend all its fuel and to move from its main sequence into what is known as red giant phase, like in this crop circle. The Sun radiates heat by converting hydrogen within its core into helium in a process known as nuclear fusion. The Sun's characteristics are just right for enabling life on Earth to flourish and be sustained. Once the hydrogen at the Sun's core becomes depleted, a process that normally takes 5 billion years, the core begins to contract. The star then collapses and releases gravitational energy into its surrounding outer layer, causing it to expand and transforming it into a red giant. When the red giant phase ends, the Sun will become a smaller, cooler star which is known as a white dwarf. Mr. Andov has determined from analyzing the crop circles that after the energy wave arrives, the Sun's white dwarf phase will be reached within months. This is the close-up of the crop circle that was delivered and the red giant phase. This is, in my perspective, one of the most important crop circles that were delivered. It appeared on July 15, 2008, on Abbey Minor in the United Kingdom. It's the depiction of our solar system with all the planets and uh, with only slight deviation. Pluto is not, is not um, the same. As it is possible to calculate the position of all the planets in the solar system on a specific future date, the alignment of the planets in the UK crop circle match what their position should be on December the 23rd, 2012. There was another depiction, another warning, which actually took place on 29th of March 2011 when we experienced uh, this uh, amazing display above uh, the sky of New Zealand. When uh, people started to analyze those stars, they were matching exactly the same, December 23rd, 2012. This crop circle, uh, the dragonfly is symbolizing the extreme changes and the phoenix, which is extremely important, it is a mythological bird that leaves a very life uh, uh, a very long lifespan and when it recognized that uh, its life is coming to an end it puts a fire into the nest and it uh, burns to, to, to ashes. So from those ashes a new small phoenix is reborn. That's a symbol that the sun is going to be reborn soon. So it's all a symbolic depiction. So red giant face is it scientifically uh, possible. What are the consequences for the planets when the sun becomes a red giant? It's going to do a, a, a slow expansion which will begin on December 23rd, 2012 and it will culminate on 28th of March 2013. The Sun here is expanded and it had swallowed uh, Mercury and, and Venus uh, completely. That leaves Earth and Mars uh, very, very dangerously close to, to the Sun. The energy emanating from the center of the galaxy will not just transform the Sun, Panayandov says it will make contact with the rest of the solar system as well. This energy as it's spreading towards the edges of the galaxy it will also pass through all the planets including Earth. So just for comparison the hottest layer of our atmosphere is thermosphere is uh, around 1500 degrees Celsius. Most of the time it's less than 1500 uh, degrees Celsius. So what happens when a cloud which is highly highly magnetic and millions of degrees uh, Celsius hot touches with the atmosphere of, of a planet which is only, let's say, 1500 degrees Celsius hot. It's just going to deplete the whole atmosphere. So there are plenty of changes on the 3D level that we need to be aware of. Mr. Andov has learned that our Sun has a companion or twin star located on the outer edge of the solar system. The Sun becoming a white dwarf will enormously change the relationship between these two stars. I will just need to mention this. The other celestial object spotted on the skies is actually a twin star orbiting around our star. And this energy that is approaching will hit that star also. And when it's going to hit that star, it's going to move towards the white dwarf. What we have seen in the astronomy, two white dwarfs are attracted by each other gravitationally. They start to rotate around each other, eventually they collide. And when those two will collide, they will produce a bigger star, which to produce enough uh, light and heat that will provide the conditions for life again. So what I'm trying uh, to say with this is that uh, this white dwarf alone is not capable of producing the same amount of light as we are receiving today, which means 
is not capable to produce the same amount of, of heat that we need to survive on the surface. Mr. Randolph believes that the energy wave heading towards Earth need not lead to disaster. Rather, we can take steps now to protect our planet. But this energy that is approaching can be shielded. And the crop circles are leading us toward the conclusion and to the answer how we can do this. The data that arrived through the crop circles, uh, plenty of information was uh, uh, about the fractal geometry. And uh, people realized that they are referring to fractals. But in reality, uh, they are referring that uh, this universe we live in is, in, is uh, a fractal universe. And we can influence it. Anne Andov says that although the recognition of fractals is correct, most don't understand that the data is saying that we live in a fractal universe and we can influence or change the universe. If you recall the research of Dr. Amoto about the water molecules, the humans are able to change the crystalline structure, turn into something magnificent. We have uh, the ability to influence uh, one of the elements, water. But that's not so where, where uh, it stops. We have the ability to influence the fractal uh, momentum or, or structure of the rest of the, of the elements that are present on Earth. So that's the first momentum that, that we need to understand, that we have the capability, the power in us that is dormant, that if united, it can produce a change to the matrix. So how, how can we do that? By combining energy. And the only known tool to me is meditation massive group global meditation where millions of people can unite into one meditative oneness and they can impact the, the, the fundamental structure of, of Earth. In addition to meditation, like Pene Andov, many across the globe are calling on humanity to immediately end our destructive habits, including the slaughter of our fellow beings for food, so that we can preserve our world for future generations. People need to change. First thing is they need to realize that this world is, uh, is, uh, is a world that we're sharing with other species and we have no right to, to kill anything. The, the first momentum is that people become vegetarians because every time when they consume uh, meat or fish there is something definitely wrong going on. I will explain in this fashion. Uh, let's say if a patient that goes to heart transplantation, before that he or she was not uh, skilled into playing piano, violin or some other musical instrument, and after that heart transplantation and the patient had recovered, uh, that same patient start to express fundamental uh, 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 skills and, and ability to play piano or, or, or uh, violin, uh, which was impossible in the, in the past. What took place? It's simply uh, like in computers. You put new hardware in and if you have the necessary drivers, the processor will recognize the new hardware and it will make it functional. In this same particular case, that previous uh, host that was hosting that heart was extremely skilled in playing violin or, or piano and that same knowledge was passed to the new owner. The brain had decoded through the DNA. So imagine when uh, people consume meat. That animal, before it was killed, had suffered a trauma, a stress, uh, a, a terror, which uh, uh, is, was condensated into, into the structure. And when we consume that stuff into, into our bodies, we actually inherit the same emotion, the same energies, and it produces a DNA virus. And this DNA virus further goes to diseases and completely uh, lowers the vibration. So it's lowering uh, our vibrational field and without uh, uh, a proper vibrational field we cannot tune into this meditative oneness that we are talking about and what is more even 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 important that we don't need to kill animals or fish because we are light beings and we can exist on on, on vegetables even on prana if some people go towards that path Thank you, Pene Andov, for sharing with us the valuable knowledge you have gathered from extraterrestrial sources regarding our universe. Your message of hope, which asks humanity to quickly embrace vegetarianism and practice group meditation to safeguard our wonderful planetary home, is a beautiful one.
that's all I thought it was. But now that I know that you know the pesticides and and fertilizers that they use on our crops are f full of fluoride as well. I mean, you're getting much more fluoride from the outer leaves of a lettuce and the outer skin of a potato, grapes, um, raisins, obviously, and most crops. Um, yeah, so we're getting like getting a lot of shit basically in our food. And then with meat, obviously the cows, whatever, pigs, they drink presumably tap water. I don't think mineral water, are they? Unless they're drinking rainwater from puddles, but I don't know about that either. I don't think they allow too many puddles because of mosquitoes. So they're drinking tap water. They're also getting shed loads of antibiotics. Oh, yeah, my point was about the organic versus, yes. So I didn't realise that uh, the, or the organic was quite so different so that if they haven't used fertilizers and pesticides then this food and if they've watered it well I suppose they might have to water it but generally maybe just the rain waters it so then yeah then you are getting good food and this is what makes sense to me because I always knew that well I always felt that they don't want to kill everyone on the planet they want to they want to keep the in crowd so it probably is other human beings that have done this that are doing this and um, they've just had knowledge for a long time, and so they're going to they want to keep some, obviously, and all this stuff with the Illuminati and Illuminati signs to keep those people in the know. So organic was probably something for them. We're going organic now, which means the rest of the food is going to be dodgy. <laughs> well, I advise anyone with their food to take off the outer layers. Because I think the worst bit is the pesticides. Uh, there's a lot of fluoride there, and a lot of fluoride compounds. And some of these are the worst, you know. Um, so take off the outer leaves, peel, peel things, peel them heavily, because you can't wash it off, it's too sticky. But what you should know is that um, these fluoride ions will, on their own, will go and sort of block your chakra. This is my understanding. Um, but if you've got um, things in your body, calcium, vitamin C, magnesium, they will bond with the fluoride and you'll poo them out quite happily. Um, but other than, I think sodium, I think there's a bit of a unsurety on sodium whether that's okay or not, because sodium seems to be absolutely everything. It's salt, I suppose. Um, and yeah, and you're at table salt, there's your fluoride there. So, uh, aluminium, very bad. When, um, if if the fluoride ion goes with an aluminium particle and becomes aluminium fluoride whatever, that's nasty. And by the way, just to let you know, fluoride is basically this real toxic thing. Um, it just bonds with anything. Uh, so, you know, it, it will bond with whatever's there. I don't know if it has a preference or not. So the thing to do is to make sure you've got some nutrition in your body, calcium, vitamin C, magnesium, don't know where you get magnesium from. Make sure you've got that in your body, and then if you consume fluoride, it's it's not it's not likely going to hurt you so much. But you really want to cut down on your fluoride intake, and fuck knows what else they put in the water. Remember when we're talking we're talking fluoride, we're always talking parts per million. So apparently on the outer leaf of a lettuce, you've got 180 parts per million, which is really really high. And they claim the safe levels to have in water is what well, was one part per million. Now they've upped it to 1.5 parts per million. But you're drinking a lot more. You know, when you consume water, you're consuming large quantities. So if you talk about a raisin that might have 45, 44 parts per million, you know, raisin's quite small, isn't it? Because uh, the grapes, again, they spray the fer they spray pesticides on the grapes, it's really sticky, can't get it off. And um, it's difficult to avoid, so the main thing is to make sure you have nutrition. And then, so I see this one thinking that the rich people, they're, they're going to be, or the people who are in the in crowd of the whoever's doing this, they're going to sort of, sort of know this, they'll probably eat all organic food. You know, I suppose if someone said to me, right, there's only gonna we're only gonna live let one million people live on this planet from now on. You're in the million people. But you better not tell anyone else. If you tell anyone else then we're gonna kill you. You know, I suppose I'll probably go along with it. Luckily I don't have to face that decision. I say luckily because I I wouldn't want that dilemma.
car. That'd be weird. So anyway, I'm in the um, I'm in the masses here, along with everyone else. I'm not scared. Yeah, bring it on. I'm you know I'm happier each time I find find out something. I mean the listening to the I listened to the BBC Radio Four. I've been listening to it for years. I thought you know I thought they'd be covering all the angles. I suppose about a year since a year or two I've been coming to the conclusions that no, certainly not getting everything at all. You've got to come to YouTube for that. Uh, God bless YouTube. You know, you've got a lot of wrong information here and a lot of people's opinions. But you just have to sort of try and understand everything for yourself. Okay, to the warning. What they've been doing the last few years. Lowering our immune systems. Oh, well, they might have started this before with antibiotics. I don't know if I mentioned it earlier, by the way, when I was talking about cows, the meat we eat, you know, they drink the water, but they're all on antibiotics, all these cows. So even if you try and avoid antibiotics, you end up getting it through the meat you eat. It's a bit of a pain. Um, yes, so the warning. Weakening our immune systems. The last three years, they've been spraying chemicals into the skies, into the atmosphere. Okay, we know it's chemtrails. A lot of people dispute it, saying, you know, contrast, but it's hard to remember. But I do not remember having those long, long, long clouds coming out of aeroplanes. I remember contrails, they go across, they leave a bit, and it goes away. I remember foggy days. I remember clear days. But I don't remember waking up in the morning, going outside, blue sky, load of planes crisscross ahead, all leaving long white streaks, and then by 10 o'clock, it's just all a haze. I don't remember that. I don't, and then sort of, you know, sometimes in the evening or whatever, you know, I'm sort of outside and I, there's breathing in sharp. It's like, you can tell there's something in the air and that's actually when I go inside and keep the windows shut for a bit. Although I always sleep with the window open. I cannot sleep with the window closed. So what they're doing is this like aluminium dust that they're spraying into the clouds, into the sky. Now I think there's two reasons that they've done this. And I think one reason is to mask the strength of the sun the last few years. Um, we've had quite mild winters, we've had crap summers because it's just been cloudy, but there's been no rain. And that was the thing that I was finding funny, it's like, oh, we've got all these clouds, but there's no rain. And, but we've got some rain now, I mean, that's good. So, but also, this aluminium and barium, I think, as well, eventually drifts back down to the ground, and we're breathing it in. And that will weaken our immune systems. So here we go. They're making us depressed, unenlightened, unhappy with the fluoride. Have now weakened our immune systems. Then the next step is to release the virus. You'll have all these depressed people, and obviously depression can lead to anger. And then they release a the virus, a biological weapon. That's what it will be. I've only just thought that now. At the Olympics. It's not going to be a. It's not going to be a dirty bomb. It's going to be dirty. But it's going to be a biological weapon, I think. And then they'll say, "Well, probably hand out some tablets." Well, I don't know exactly what it's going to be, but I think it's going to be this summer. I think all the hype about December two thousand and twelve. I think that's um, a smoke screen. I think that's misinformation too. To make people think, you know, they're not going to worry about things up until the late stage of December, and by then we'll already have had what we're going to have. I don't know about Nibiru. Nibiru makes sense to me in some ways. I sort of believe in a planet X, but I think if there was anything coming, we would have definitely seen it by now. The pictures were getting on YouTube, it's nothing. It was supposed to come round in May, June time. Well, it didn't, did it? Yes, it did, and we didn't notice it. It's possible. 
Something is going on with the sun, though. I mean, either the sun's getting stronger or or it's the global warming effect, but my God, when the sun comes out and it's clear, it is hot. I mean, March, we had some sunny days in March, and I was wearing my shorts straight away. It was like summer. It was like a nice summer's day then. And then we had the hot spell in May, and that was hot. It was uncomfortable hot. It wasn't nice. You didn't want to, I didn't want to be in the sun for too long at all. It was too strong. I mean, it's okay probably if you're on a beach and you can dip into the pool or whatever, but not when you're working and stuff. So, I think I've um, summed it up that um, I think something's going to happen during the Olympics because of some dreams I had a few years ago. Unexplained deviations in the orbits of Uranus and Neptune point to a large outer solar system body of four to eight Earth masses on a highly tilted orbit beyond seven billion miles from the Sun. In the past two decades, astronomers have joined the search to look for one more planet in our own solar system. They designate such a planet, Planet X, meaning both unknown and tenth. is 1978, which was just about six weeks after we discovered the fact that Pluto had a satellite. Once you have a satellite for a planet, you can determine how heavy it is. It turns out Pluto is very much smaller and lighter weight than we had thought, which meant that Pluto has no influence, no appreciable influence on the motions of the planets Uranus and Neptune. At that point, we voiced a hypothesis that this means that there is at least one yet-to-be-discovered planet in the outer reaches of the solar system. Over the past two decades, physicists have joined astronomers in the search for the mysterious Planet X. Now, one of the things we, we did in 1978, having made this prediction that there was a, an additional planet, 10th or 12th, depending on your point of view, we sort of put our money where our mouth was, as it were, and we went out and we started looking for this thing. We've been able to refine the search area somewhat, and get it rather narrowed down. We, we do our predictions based on the observed anomalies in Uranus and Neptune. We actually are currently looking down in the region of Centaurus which is just south of the, of the constellation Libra. But if, if it is in the kind of orbit that we describe here, 
it would have to be a planet that would have a mass something like three to five times the mass of the Earth. This would put it uh, intermediate between the gaseous planets like Uranus and Neptune and the terrestrial planets that we, we have in the inner part of the solar system. So if, if this planet turns out to be in a 3,600 year orbit, then its, its mass will be correspondingly larger. This one here is the map of the solar system as we know it. Uh, the inner planets, this is the orbit of planet Pluto. And this here is the orbit that I have proposed for uh, the tenth planet. And here's where we think it is right about now in its orbit. If planet X exists, we are not alone. However, today on this video is that just recently news reports have come out that there may be a massive super earth type planet orbiting outside our solar system that we don't know about and this is confirmed and I'll put the links in the video description so you guys can check it out. So here's what we found. Dwarf planet discovery hints at a super earth in our solar system. Astronomers have increased the size of the observable solar system after spotting a 450 kilometer wide object orbiting the sun. The lump of ice and rock circles the sun at a greater distance than any known object. If its size is confirmed, it could qualify as a dwarf planet in the same category as Pluto. Researchers said that the discovery proves the existence of the inner Oort cloud, a region of icy bodies that lies far beyond the orbit of Neptune. And let's remember that Neptune is the most remote planet in our solar system. Until a proper name is decided upon, the body is known only as 2012 VP113. According to the science journal Nature, the team that discovered it called it VP for short, or Biden after U.S. Vice President Joe Biden. Its pink tinge comes from the radiation damage that alters the makeup of frozen water, methane, and carbon dioxide on the surface. Though exciting in its own right, the discovery raises more tantalizing prospect for many astronomers that a super-Earth up to 10 times the mass of our planet orbits the Sun at such a great distance that has never been seen. Astronomers found 2012 VP113 by taking snapshots of the night sky an hour or so apart with an instrument called the Dark Energy Camera on the U.S. National Optical Astronomy Observation Telescope in Chile. When they turn the images into a time-lapse movie of the sky, they could see the new body moving against the background of stationary stars. This object has the most distant orbit known, Scott Shepard at the Carnegie Institution of Washington told The Guardian. It extends the known boundary of the observable solar system. The object's orbit brings it as close as 12 billion kilometers from the sun and swings out as far as 67 billion kilometers. There are comets that come from even farther out, but they pass much closer to our home planet. The solar system has three distinct regions. Closest to the sun are the rocky planets, such as Venus, Earth, and Mars. Farther out are the gas giants, such as Saturn and Jupiter. More distant still, beyond the orbit of Neptune, is a band of icy objects called the Kuiper Belt. In 2003, astronomers found an object beyond the Kuiper Belt, which they called Sedna. For more than a decade, the object was a loner, an anomaly in the solar system, but the new body, 2012 VP113, lurks in the same no man's land of space, leading astronomers to believe that there could be thousands of similar bodies waiting to be discovered there. People wondered if Sedna was unique, and 10 years on, we have at last found another object that shows it is not. There's probably a large population of objects out there. The latest work has already thrown up an intriguing possibility. The angle of the body's orbit and that of Sedna's are strikingly similar, an effect most likely caused by a gravitational tug of another unseen body. One possibility is a super-Earth that traces so large an orbit around the Sun that it has never been seen. If you took a super-Earth and put it a few hundred astronomical units out, the gravity could shepherd Sedna and this new object into the orbits they have. An astronomical unit is around 150 million kilometers, or the mean distance from the Earth to the Sun. Earlier this month, NASA's Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer, or Weiss, reported the results from its search. Okay guys, this is uh, Frank, and I'm doing an update on uh, the Black Star uh, object, Fiery Messenger, or um, Second Sun, whatever you want to call it. Uh, today is June 22nd, uh, 2014, and the reason why I'm doing this update is because there is quite some confusion about uh, the current low period on the planet. There's not so much seismic activity as we had in April or May. In March, um, and I wanted to get the picture clear myself, so this is why I'm doing the update. And I think I know the reason why this is happening, um, and I'll show that to you. This is an article that I wrote in uh, January this year. It's about the fire messenger. That's what I prefer to call it. And if I go down, you can see how I started the investigation. Um, it, I, it, it started when I did some research on earthquakes, and I noticed that between 1700 and 1952. Um, there were only three magnitude, two, magnitude 9 earthquakes, and they all occurred with Uranus in approximately the same area in the sky. This, uh, and I thought this is not a coincidence. And so I, I, I dug into that a little, and then I uh, went into the history of Planet X, which goes back all the way to the um, 19th century, 
Um, you can read it all here. This is the entire history. The interesting thing here is that astronomers in the early 80s actually confirmed um, what Uranus already indicated, which is an object uh, on the western part of the constellation Orion, which is here. You can see this on the picture. This is the western part of Orion, and here's Uranus during those um, large earthquakes between 1700 and 1868, uh, 1952. Uh, so this was actually the first confirmation for me. And then I found, uh, here's the planet the ecliptic, which means that the object is coming from the south uh, and then slowly going upwards in, into the inner solar system. Um, there's actually a picture of this object, and here it is. Uh, you can, th you may wonder if this is the real object. I think it is. It was uh, found by some guy on YouTube. Uh, he has the coordinates on the western part of Orion. And Google Sky, this picture was taken between 2000 and 2005. And Google Sky at the same coordinates is showing something completely different. It, it has marked the object completely. And I zoomed in and I 